All right. Well, welcome, rel welcome, and uh, well, Yumbo. I learned this morning. So, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Peter Ulrich, or Ulrich, uh, pronounced correctly by Getty. Uh, I changed the title a bit of my talk to make it uh, a bit more about what I'm going to talk about, and it's going to be how you can future-proof your software with architecture, with pa um, architectural patterns. And uh, yeah, I, I already received a very nice um, introduction. Here's a bit more about me. I'm currently a full stack developer at StudiTemps in Germany. I have a master in software engineering. Yes, I am the host of Pretend Code. I am the ex host of Explain Blockchain X because the podcast is not actively maintained anymore. It's still on all the platforms if you want to learn about the fundamentals of blockchain technology. But I just named it X because I'm not actively doing anything. Um, yeah, I'm passionate about Elixir architecture and design and bicycle activism. So I fight for more, uh, better bike lanes and so on. And I do indeed love Africa. In fact, I um, work there a bit in South Africa as a teacher. Uh, I traveled through all of Eastern Europe, uh, sorry, Eastern Africa on a motorcycle. Uh, you can see me here in the Sahara. And the, I actually went to Nairobi, Kenya, of course. And I, I remember two things. One of them is the traffic, and the other one is the, um, the animal refuge or orphanage, which was very really nice. So yeah, that's why I, I, I quite like Africa. Anyway, so uh, let's go to the problem that I'm going to talk about today, which is your software. And your software is a problem or can become a problem because it evolves over time. And that means that your functionality of the software changes, like you have to add and remove and update functionality. Um, your business logic can also change. Uh, business logic, if you're not familiar with that, um, with that term, business logic is, is like requirements that come from, your, from the business side of your product, so not from your software side. Uh, for example, in Germany, we had, uh, you were allowed uh, for many years to buy alcohol when you were 16 years old. And then they changed that to 18 years old. So you're not allowed to, to buy that anymore. Um, and that is, for example, business logic you would have to keep into uh, in consideration when you build your software. So though, then the software vendors had to change the software and uh, only allow people who are above 18, 18 and above to buy alcohol. That is an example of business logic. So that changes as well over time, as we've seen. And of course, technologies can change. Like now we are developing in a beautiful new language called Elixir, but it's not that old compared to other languages. And also other things like databases and, and uh, web stacks and whatnot, all the frameworks. If you ever worked uh, with front-end uh, technologies, everything changes a lot. And it will also influence your software because your software has to adopt that change and adapt to the new, new things, the new cool things. And of course, the ways of, uh, of interacting with your software might change. So you might start out with a website that, uh, yeah, with a software that only has a website, but then um, your business grows and you decide on integrating a, an app like a, on a mobile. So then you also have to allow your app to communicate with your software, and that also means that yeah, the ways of interacting with your software change over time. And requirements as well, of course, business requirements. Maybe you start out with a website that is purely in English and then uh, you internationalize the, so the website and you have to add German, Spanish and so on to it. So those are requirements that change as well. And all these changes, they lead to problems or they can lead to problems, which is the complexity grows. So if you add more code, more functionality, it will become more complex. Your code base is harder to navigate, harder to understand, and so on. And if you don't um, 
maintain the complexity well, you will end up getting spaghetti code or the big ball of mud where everything is connected with everything and you will have a hard time understanding why if you change one part of your code base, another part of your code base breaks and so on. So that is a problem. And it also makes adapting to the change more costly because you have to spend more time on understanding your code, writing new features will take longer and uh, yeah, more bugs will occur and so on. But adapting to the change means it will take you more time to, for example, add new technologies like the uh, RP you need for your, for, for your mobile application. It will take longer to integrate that than you would like to. And also the maintenance becomes more costly because uh, let's say you have an open source software, you use a library there and it's really in the heart of your software, like you cannot go without it. And then that open source project is not maintained any longer. Well, then you have a problem because um, maybe it has some security bugs in it or some other bugs, and then you have to work around that. So the maintenance there becomes more costly as well. But to the problem there is, well, a solution, not the solution, <laughs> but uh, it can be software architectural patterns. And uh, what are architectural patterns? I just showed you some of them here. Um, there are different ones like MVC, Model View Controller, you might have heard of. Maybe you even heard about the explicit architecture that I talked about in one of my YouTube uh, videos as well. Then you have more organizational or orchestrational patterns like microservices, uh, SOA, so service-oriented architecture, orchestration-oriented and so on. And you have some more behavioral uh, patterns like leader follower pipes and filters and so on. But in general, an architectural pattern, it is a blueprint of your software. So it gives you the general architecture, the general way your software should look like um, for your software. And it's typically quite high level. It does not always or very rarely go into the, the lower levels. So that explains how two classes interact or two modules. It's rather high level. So you rather talk about groups of classes and so on. As architectural patterns can be a guide during the active development. So you can take it as a, as a um, reference guide uh, in deciding how you should develop your application. And they can also be a reference while you refactor it. So you might have an existing software and you want to refactor it and make it nicer, so to say. Then you can take an architect architectural pattern and as a reference and then refactor a software so that it looks more like the pattern. So it can be both. But uh, let me just show you three examples of architectural patterns and how they can help you with um, handling evolution of your software. The first one you might have heard already and that you use if you write Elixir with Phoenix, you use that every day, is the model view controller pattern. It is quite simple and I would say quite easy to understand. So if you start a new Phoenix project, uh, you will Phoenix or Mix or Elixir will generate a couple of classes for you, a couple of groups. And uh, you, you know already the views and templates probably. And then in between you have some controllers or live views. And at the bottom of everything, you have contexts that um, Ecto generates for you. Some schemas, Ecto schemas probably, and your database. And if you think about these groups as layers, you can, you can put them into three layers. One of them is the view layer. The other one is the controller layer. And the last one is the model layer. And all the views that you have are part of this layer. So this is just one way of giving, uh, giving some structure to these, uh, to these groups. And that's basically the MVC pattern. So the MVC pattern is to tell you you have three layers or three general groups of, of functionality. And then you, you look, okay, where does my class fit in? So if I write a controller, it's part of the controller uh, layer, so to say. There are two rules that you should know about, but then you might ignore them at times. It depends on the situation. Two rules to the MVC. Um, the one is that you should not typically have calls from a lower layer to an upper layer. So your context should not call a controller or your schema should not call a live view. If you have these kind of calls in your code, it is a bad smell, so to say, a code smell. 
And you really have to look into it and decide if it's necessary that your schema calls your live view, for example. And most of the time it isn't. In, in just in one case, which is allowed, so to say, which is okay, is if you have um, uh, pops up, if you have published and subscribed things. So something changes in your, in your schema. So your context um, just publishes a, a notification and your controller will listen to that. This way you have an indirect communication or indirect function call from one bottom layer to the top layer. But um, yeah, since PubSub is, is so ingrained in the MVC pattern, it is allowed, so to say. But yeah, just make sure that you don't have any direct function calls from lower layers to upper layers. And the second rule is uh, you cannot step over one layer. This is also a rule that is sometimes hard to adhere to, but um, it always depends on the situation. In general, let's say one rule that you should adhere to is, for example, if you have a view, the view should not interact with your database. Not at all, actually. So if you have your repo used in a view, you should be really careful and consider moving that to the controller. Because the controlling layer here, its, all, its whole purpose is to aggregate your data and pass it onto the views for decorations for presentation purposes. So if you have some direct function calls from your views or something else to a lower layer, like the context or a database, you should rather try to get rid of it. Um, what I typically do is if it's a reading call, so for example, the view asks a schema, how should I present your value? Like if it's a, a user, you know, and you want to show a, views, a user in your view uh, and the view might ask the user schema, okay, how do I, how do you want to be presented? Is it with first name, last name, with email address, with an ID, something else? So that is a call I would allow because it's on reading, but if you don't have any writing calls, so a view should never update your schema. It should always go through the controller and the context. Okay, this is the uh, the MVC in very short uh, short terms. It has some pros and some cons. I would say a pro is it's rather easy to understand, and also Phoenix comes with it, so you have something right in front of you that you can analyze. I would say it's good for small to medium sized projects. Afterwards, it can become uh, complex, and you have a good technical separation of components. So you separate the controllers from the views based on their technical functionality. And the cons are, it can become quite complex and chaotic quickly. So uh, yeah, if you add a lot of controllers, a lot of views, a lot of schemas and so on, you will have a lot of complexity and like crisscrossing calls and a big ball of mud quickly if you don't look out. It doesn't have any domain separation. I will come back to this a bit later, um, but also there is coupling between domain contexts. So. Uh, let's say, uh, okay, quickly, a domain separation is not based on your technical functionality, but on your, on your business domain. So if, you, if, you, if we talk about the Elixir conference uh, website, uh, the Elixir Africa conference website, you could separate into two domains, which is presenting the information about the conference and uh, the, for example, ticket purchasing. Web, uh, part of it. So these are two different domains and with two different requirements, but they are part of the same website, for example. And uh, if you only do MVC, you don't separate the controllers that are for the ticket purchasing from the controllers that are for the presenting, uh, for the information presenting domain. So that's a problem. And yeah, I would say it's not suitable for large teams. If you have a lot, like eight or 10 developers, uh, depends as well, of course. Or But particularly if you have multiple teams that um, work on the same code base, it can also become quite uh, complex. But moving on to a slightly improved version of the MVC, which is the, sorry, the component-based MVC. I call it component-based, but yeah, maybe different people call it differently. And the idea behind that is, is that you separate your MVC uh, architectural pattern into components. And I explained that earlier. So let's say that we have a component that is um, responsible for the ticket purchasing of this conference. And the, the other component is, yeah, is uh, responsible for the conference info to present it. Um, these I would then separate into two different, yeah, just basically folders in your project. So in your lib folder, you have then not 
um, my app, so to say, and my app web, but you have ticket purchase and you have conference info. And inside these two uh, components, then you would have all the things that you need for that component, like views, templates, controllers, contacts, schemas, uh, and the same. So this is one folder, this is one folder, and they might share a common database connection. If you want to be even more cool, you can also give each component its own database. So then you have a total separation. Um, but yeah, so this is already a slight improvement because now you can have, for example, uh, big teams, you can split them in two and say, well, the one team works on this component, the other one on that component, and they don't step on each other's toes. So yeah, uh, just here, like uh, a little abbreviated, you have one server, so it's one deployment unit with two components and they both talk to the same database. Um, these two are also part of the same mix uh, application, but they can also be umbrella applications. It's also a different thing. Uh, the pros of this is you have a domain and a technical separations of components. So you, you still have the, uh, the MVC technical separation, but you also have the domain uh, component separation. You can work independently on the component without stepping on the toe of other developers uh, of the other team. Uh, and it's just one step away from microservices. So you could then take each of these components, give them an own database, deploy them on different servers. And um, yeah, you, what, the, you, what you still need to do is um, to, to establish a communication protocol between those. But in general, you have two different components and uh, then you can work on them independently. In this case, I would say a con is that it's still a single deploy unit. So the problem here is that uh, if the ticket purchasing team has a new release and they want to go online with it, they have to wait for the conference info team and ask them, are you ready for release? Because everything is released at once. You can work around that with, um, with pull requests on GitHub and so on and release branches and so on. But yeah, you have to be aware of this. And the also potentially a con is they can be coupling between the uh, between the two components by, for example, shared schemas and utility classes. So uh, if you have these again, like this context might need a schema from the other component as well, like a user or an account, for example. And then you have um, calls between these components and that also again um, couples them tightly together. So you have to be aware of those. Don't make too many uh, cross component calls than necessary. Right, this has been the component-based MVC. Let's talk about a third one, which is called the explicit architecture. And just a heads up, with the explicit architecture, it, it is quite a complex topic. And um, I created two YouTube videos about it. If you want to learn more about this in depth later on, uh, just go to my Peter and Code uh, YouTube channel and you will find it there. I also link to it in the uh, slides. So let's talk about the explicit architecture. Um, let's start with the MVC problems. Uh, so if you take the MVC and you evolve it, uh, I said, you know, your software evolves in different ways, like technologies change, requirements change, uh, business logic changes and so on. And if we look at that and let's take this MVC and add th some things to it. So maybe, as I said, you want to create an app for your software. <clears throat> And then you also need to create new controllers for that because you don't go through the Phoenix views and everything anymore. You have an RP controller then. So these need to then be connected to your context and so on. And they might also then need some things from the controller, from the Phoenix controllers. For example, checking the age of a user or uh, how to render a price or something. You probably before didn't put that anywhere else but the, the controller with which you rendered your templates. And now if you have a second type of controller, like an RP controller, they will have functionality, they will have logic that both of these controllers need. And then you have a problem because where do you put that stuff? Do you create another utility class for that or something? Yeah. And also um, if you then go on and you use events and so on for your software, you also have event consumers that are that are that receive some external input events and they also then need to call your context for example uh, the event consumer could be a ticket was purchased 
and you get that event from uh, you, you get that event from Eventim or something, for example, from an external service. Then you also need to somehow put that into your uh, your software, and you see that in this case, for example, the context group is already um, yeah already receives a lot of calls and has to serve to a lot of different requirements. So the RP controller doesn't need the same data as the Phoenix controller, for example. And the event consumer doesn't need anything what the controllers need. So then everything aggregates in the context group and it, became, it, it can become quite messy quite quickly. Right. And then also on the other side, not only in the receiving side, but maybe you want to then publish some stuff as well. So on the sending side, also some things might change and uh, you need to add some stuff. And again, you add the event publisher to the context group. So everything is here and it becomes quite messy. So a solution for that is the explicit architecture. And it is a combination of the hexagonal architecture um, and the onion architecture. I believe hexagonal also has a different name. It's called ports and adapters. Yeah, so if you want to learn more about these two uh, patterns, I added an, a link to a very nice article uh, of Herberto Grasse, who wrote about this extensively. All right, so on the right side, you see that I have the, the MVC pattern that I explained earlier. And I will now show, I will now show you how to move these groups into the, archi the explicit architecture. And uh, again, the explicit architecture is structured around circles instead of layers. So before that, we had a top-down hierarchical layer pattern, and this is more uh, um, yeah, an, like a circle, circle layer. So you don't have an up and down. In this case, you have a left and right, but also that can change. And let's just start. So, um, so don't think about the hierarchy anymore. Think about circles now. The first thing we need to do is we need to move our schemas to the heart, to the very core of our software. And one important characteristic of the explicit architecture is that it tries to prevent, uh, that it tries to protect any code that doesn't change as much, so that's not that dy net dynamic, from code that changes a lot. So it tries to keep at its core very, very stable code and build on top of that towards the outside. So if you then later on need to change your software, you very rarely change the core, which has like which is the foundation to many things that are built on top of it. So if you don't change your foundation that often, you also don't have to change everything that is on top of it. So that's why you move the schema to the heart of your software and you rename them domain models, which is a domain-driven design concept. But just it's the same as a schema. Just think about it a bit differently later on. So that's the first step you do. Then you move your controllers and everything to the outside, to the left side of your architecture. So these are interactors. These, these are like things that are just on the left side, on the being interacted side. And you don't really care about them too much. Like you can interchange them and so on, but uh, they, they become less important now. Then you also move your views and templates that way. So also they become not that interesting to you anymore. And now it becomes the tricky part because we have the contexts group of, of modules and they previously in the in the MVC that I showed you before, they were a lot of calls going to the context modules. So what we do first is we split the context into two separate things. Because if you have a context class right now in your Phoenix project, it will probably do, do two things. One of them is have some business logic inside of it, some, some steps. For example, if you have a new user uh, and it like you want to register a new user, you might first check that the user does not exist yet. Then you might create that user. Then you might send an email to that new user saying, hey, cool that you're there. Please confirm your email. So those are three steps that you need to do in sequence. And that's like a, a business uh, a use case, basically, registering a user. So And that's the one thing that your contacts do. And the other thing is just retrieval of data. So it calls your database, gets some data and passes it back. And we split these two things into application services, 
those are the things that now hold your check that the user isn't there, like that, that it doesn't exist. Create the user, send the email to the user. And the second group of things is a repository, which is just simply reading and writing data. And we delete the context and move the, the two groups to our boundary. And the application service now becomes the entry point to all our external things. So an, a controller, a Phoenix controller would call the application service register user with like an email, for example. And the live view would do the same thing. Your RP controller would do the same thing. And your event consumer might also do the same thing. So they all go through the same entry point to your uh, module, uh, to the explicit architecture, to your software. Again, the repositories talk to the, uh, to the database and event publisher go on the right side where you have the publishing side. I realized I don't have that much time left. Oh, actually very little time. So let me just show you this picture. You have seen it now, okay. <laughs> Some pros and cons. Um, yeah, it's, it's good for, for things like it's flexible for changes. You can just change anything in the boundaries. Don't have to change that much in the middle of it. Um, it protects the less dynamic code from the more dynamic code. So everything that's inside doesn't change as much. The cons are it's more complex than the MVC. It requires basic knowledge for DDD, domain-driven design. It's not suitable for multiple teams, like if you have it on one server. And it's little suitable for large teams because you still step on each other's toes. There is more information about this, as I said, the article of Roberto Grasse, uh, my episodes on Peter and Code. And there's a really nice book, Fundamentals of Software Architecture. And with that, I would like to thank you and ask you for questions. And you can follow me on Twitter if you want to hear. 